Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast, episode number 117. Early season deer hunting tactics with Dr. Grant Woods, Growing Deer TV. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. This is Skip Peterson from Gearhead Archery. Gear up for another amazing podcast with Jay and Dusty on the Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. Hey, everybody, this is Craig Cushman at Hunter Specialties, and you're getting ready to hear another great podcast from the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. I'm Lee Lukowski. And I'm Tiffany Lukowski, and you're listening to our favorite hunting podcast on iTunes. The Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Welcome to the show. This is Jay Scott, your host of the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. I hope you're enjoying your early season deer hunting so far. I know I am, and I know that my good friend Dusty Phillips is, too. Is that- yeah, I, I am, man. It's crazy. Jay, have you, have you ever felt like you just need to hear from somebody that really knows the whitetail? Have you ever felt that? I, all the time. Sometimes, I, you know, because you question yourself all the time when you're in the woods. Am I doing this right? Am I am I thinking about this the, the right way? Should I have done that? It happens all the time. It, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's just a... It, it's a never-ending like question your tactics and skills and you're, you're always wondering and, and then you're like who, who can i contact for that you know you ever thought that way i do <laughs> all the time and a lot of times i end up tuning into the podcast to be quite honest yeah absolutely i agree to that but you know that there, there's somebody that that really has the knowledge and, and, and really has put in the time and the, and the capabilities to study the whitetail and, and study a whole lot of other aspects that goes into hunting whitetail Really? Who are you talking about? Dr. Grant Woods. Oh, man. He's a blast from the past. He, you know, we've had him on the show before, and that was it was a while ago. Let me find the episode number so you can uh, listen to this in a tandem effort. He was on the Big Buck podcast back in November 2013 where we talked about uh, deer biology 101 and growing big deer. Can you believe that? Yeah, it's amazing. But, you know... It- Season opening up here, and it seems like that we need to get into some early season tactics for you know hunting mature whitetails. Yes, and as we are in the season, this is a great time to talk about early season tactics and what you can do right now to make your hunt more successful before it gets into the the rut part of the season. Let's let's get the man that can can help us out and and, and tell us the factual information that he studied for all these years. Dr. Grant Woods on the mic. Dr. Grant Woods, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. How are you? I'm great, guys. Thanks for having me. It's good to have you back on the show. We talked to you, uh, geez, I think it was a couple of years ago now. Um, But, uh, you know, we we always appreciate an insight as to what's happening out there in the deer woods, and you're just the man to talk to. Well, you know, I just got out of Deer Woods a few hours ago, <clears throat> or less than that, actually, taking my 84-year-old father hunting, so I can give you a little bit of insight, but the night before, the, September 15th is the opening day of deer season here in Missouri, and we had an extremely exciting hunt that first night. Actually, you want to fill us in on what happened there? No, I don't give those secrets away. No, I'm just even, you know, <laughs> we had been watching all summer, and we had a, I, I live in the Ozark Mountains of Missouri. It's basically an oak hickory forest. There's no ag, no, you don't see any, you know, combines or big tractors or seed trucks or grain drills. There's none of that in counties around me. So we're we're hunting timber. We're timber hunters, and, and we have a big white oak crop this year. I had one coming on, which makes it very difficult to hunt because, you know, deer are here, there, everywhere really really difficult to pattern so we were like oh gosh gonna be one of those years but we'd set up on a white oak tree in the middle of a food plot uh thinking you know those are usually open grown oaks drop a little bit earlier and actually produce a few more acorns just you know you've seen big oak trees in cemeteries or city blocks or campuses or whatever and they have big huge acorns yeah 
And uh, guys, almighty, I thought, well, this is a, you know, shooting fish in the barrel attack night. We'll at least get a doe on here. And about 30 minutes before dark, uh, a nice three-year-old buck came out, and then another one, and then another one, and some does and fawns, and sure enough, a four-year-old came out. We tried to shoot four-year-old older here just for me. My dad and kids got a green card, shoot whatever they want. And we watched those deer. It was like a winter storm has come in. They came out into the food plot, never came to the acorn tree, put their head down and gorged themselves. And I'm hearing that from a lot of my hunting buddies throughout much of the Midwest. Deer just stepping out and gorging themselves in food plots. So kind of a, you know, a current recent tip going on right there. Hmm. Like that. Okay. So we'd like to talk early season deer hunting tactics. And I know you study this day in, day out down where you are and we you kind of filled us in on all the stuff that was going on uh the last time we we spoke like how you study them but i wanted to specifically zone in on early season tactics with you and find out all the after all the years of research that you've been conducting what are some of the key points uh, that we can kind of take away and what should we be focusing on as hunters right now well, you know, early season buck hunting is is can be really challenging because it's a period of change. So, you know, early season here in Missouri is <clears throat> September 15th. Iowa doesn't open to October 1st. You know, there's a little bit of range in there. South Carolina opened August 15th. South Florida opens in July. A lot of people don't know that. The rut in South Florida is in July. Literally, bucks are breeding does during July. Hmm. So early season is kind of... But let's just take, you know, the bulk of the whitetails range, mid-September, early October. Right. Um, bucks are, are going from a very low testosterone level. And so they're, you know, they're growing velvet and they're hanging out in bachelor groups and tolerating each other. And right as bow season's opening throughout much of that area, that's all changing. That test- testosterone level is kicking up. Uh, and, and with that, it sends some cues to for the antlers to switch from pumping protein up there. And this is important to pumping calcium. That's what makes a hard antler, calcium. They actually change composition. Hmm. And so deer, before that testosterone level surge occurs, are, are chasing protein, bucks and does. I mean, man, they're just, they're just really chasing protein. And right when that surge of testosterone occurs in bucks and hormones change in does also, you know, they're stopping lactating, stuff like that, they're going for energy. They're, they are predisposed to store fat for the winter. Southern okay. deer, northern deer, they're going to store fat. And so, like like me and a lot of guys and gals across America, boy, you spend all summer watching a food plot or if you live where they are, bean fields or whatever, and you got deer on the clock. I mean, men are just coming out, and you're like entering the big buck contest locally, and you're going to slam this bruiser the first day of season because he's like clockwork coming out wherever is the source of protein every day. And about the time season opens up, you don't see the deer anymore, and you swear poachers got him or Martians got him or, you know, something happened. <laughs> right. But I've most likely before. what happened, and that may happen somewhere, I'm not sure, but most likely what happened to us is when that hormone changed, literally the the needs, the nutritional needs of the deer changes, and they're not stepping out in that bean field because that's that's not giving them what they need at that time. The pods aren't ripe yet. And they're going to a source of carbohydrates, whether that's corn or depending on where you live or acorns where I live here or feed if you're in, you know, parts of Texas or something like that. They're going to carbohydrates. And that change occurs in a 15 day window, more or less, about when most of the states open bow season. Hmm. And so it's, it's bothersome to hunters because you've had this trail camera pattern or you're watching deer or whatever's going on. And just about time you grab the bow and get in a state, the pattern changes. So that's kind of rule number one. Expect the pattern change. Okay. Take, good. take an inventory of deer during the summer. These are the deer. And what it's really telling you is at minimum, their home range overlaps my hunting area. But gotcha. realize that sometimes between September 15th and October 1st, they're probably going to shift in most areas, the areas of the home range they're using. Gotcha. So, okay. So you inventory during the summer, you start patterning the kill later on. Gotcha. All right. So you you know there's a change coming and you need to prepare for it. You're just taking a tally of what's in a, an area. Yep. Got it. And along with that, when that testosterone level is low, and, I, you know, most guys can probably relate to this. You're just a little bit more subdued. You're not so quick to jump in a fight or, <laughs> you know, have road rage or whatever's going on. <laughs> and, and bucks are the same way. Boy, you, it's amazing what you can get away with in summer. You know, I mean, right. you're like, man, this deer, he didn't know I'm here. Yeah. Well, he probably knows you're there. He just doesn't care. You're not a threat. He doesn't care. 
And when that, that switch flips, and it flips because of decreasing daylight, that the de- decreasing daylight sends a signal, and I won't bore anyone with all the science, but through the eyes to some certain glands in the body. Hmm. And, and, and that signal not only says, hey, go get some carbohydrates, go get some Snickers bars instead of salad bar, and it's also saying, you know what, you need to be as big and as bad and as alert as you can because the game is on. Put your game face on. Hmm. And and so hunters get faked out by saying, man, those deer, don't, they don't even know I'm here. This is going to be an easy deer to tag to, man, I stepped on a stick and I haven't seen a deer in three months after I stepped on that stick. I don't know what's going on out there. So that's kind of rule number two is realize the the alertness of deer literally is going to change in that same time frame. I've noticed that, and I, I couldn't really put my finger on it, but it always seemed that way. All right. So you, this is something you've studied. You under, you now have a trigger mechanism as to why this happens, when it happens, and now how. Yeah, what do you do about it? What do we what do, do, about, do about, it? about it? Yeah. 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 So, so the best thing, and we all don't have this advantage, but the best thing is have a history on the property where you're hunting so you don't get faked out. You know, man, like here at my place, gosh, I'm seeing deer in food plots all summer and kids are seeing them, whatever. But I know I need to be on the back of a white oak ridge somewhere come bow season. And mm. and and most likely if, there, if there's an acorn crop. And let me throw out a little ditty here. The, the best way to kind of predict your acorn crop, of course, is go out scouting with your binos or whatever. But a really useful thing is think about for white oaks. Think back a few months to the spring, and was there a late frost? Because the number one killer of white oaks is a late frost. Oak trees they develop flowers like a rose or other flowers, except they're really small and they're not they're not glamorous, so no one really pays attention to them. And and those flowers occur in most areas about when a late frost would occur. Okay. And a frost will damage those flowers, so they won't pollinate and they won't make acorns. And on a red oak, there's a huge amount of confusion about this. Red oaks, when when they flower one year, if they flowered successfully in 2014, they will make an acorn during 2015. No good. But they flower every year. So they could have developing acorns, which are really small and no one really notices, and full-size acorns on the same tree. So a red oak can make acorns every year, but the acorns were hunting flowered the year before, if that's not too confusing. So I'm always thinking about the frost the previous year for red oaks and a frost, late frost this year for white oaks. And of course, deer prefer white oaks always. They're lower in acid. White oaks rot quicker because they don't have as much acid in them. And because they don't have as much acid in them, they're not as bitter for deer to eat. So deer are going to go to white oaks first. Okay. And, but if we have a warm rain, like we may, and this sounds horrible, but we may have been blessed here. We just last week had about three and a half inches of a pretty warm rain when white oaks were starting to fall here. And, and you know, white oaks are, of course, are seeds. So let's think about this. We get warm water. That acorn falls down in a moist, warm bed of leaves. It's still pretty warm outside, sun shining, and a big warm rain. What's going to happen? Well, that, that seed is going to sprout. And as soon as the seed starts forming at taproot or sprouting or busting the shell, the chemistry changes such that a deer is just not going to eat it. A deer is not going to touch it. And and so I'm not trying to be mean like I want my deer and squirrels and turkey to starve, but we have so many acorns here that if, you know, a week's worth of them rotted, it sure makes my hunting a lot easier. Gotcha. Okay. That's interesting. All right. Let's go back to that tree for a minute, um, and it's the the wet oaks specifically. So the, the flowers on the tree yep. from the spring of 2014 are the acorns we are now watching drop from the trees today. In on, on a red oak. On a red oak, okay. So a red oak takes two years to develop. A white oak flowers and develops in the same year, in the same growing season. Got it. Okay, boy, that's super inf- good information to know. Yeah, and, and, and if you're in an area, like most areas have a mixture of red and white oaks, uh, deer are going to eat red oaks, excuse me, white oaks first yep. because they're lower in acid. And, they, and you know, if you, you, know, you walk through the woods, you pick one up, peel the husk off, taste it, you can taste the difference. A red oak will pucker you up quickly. It's very bitter. Right. And as it falls and lays on the ground and weathers, you know, hot, cold, hot, cold, and rain on it, that acid, it's actually a tannic acid, will leach out of the red oak, and they'll become more palatable as time goes on. So we had a huge red oak crop here at my place last year, and when we were killing turkeys this spring in March and April, they were full of red oak acorns hmm. that were still good, obviously good. 
And, and so, you know, no wonder we had trouble patterning deer last fall. There's so many acorns on the ground. I mean, they eat bed within 10 feet. It's hard to get between them. Right. And, and hard to get a pattern because there's just food everywhere. You know, the, the resource isn't limited. So, you know, they can be here today. You bump them, they're there tomorrow. They don't have to come back. It's not like a soybean field or the last standing crop in Iowa. Everybody's cut their corn and you got a little bit of corn left standing. Those deer are coming in. They're going to fight the gauntlet to get there. When there's acorns everywhere, that's just not the case. Boy, you bump them, they're gone. Okay. So in reality, you're, and like you said, you're not hoping for the deer to starve, but you're looking for a smaller acorn crop where perhaps there was a frost the year before on the red oaks. Yep. Yep. A little fewer, you know, like, uh, you know, so if you, if you live in the Smoky Mountains or, you know, here in the Ozark Mountains or wherever it's primarily timbered, you learn to really dislike acorns because they make hunting very, very hard. And, and by the way, they're not that good for a deer. Deer eat them. Mm-hmm. You know, I eat fudge. Fudge isn't very good for me. Deer eat acorns. They're about 7% protein. And tannic acid, the acid in acorns, actually binds to calcium. Mm-hmm. We want deer to keep calcium because, you know, calcium turns into the bones or bigger antlers. And, and when deer eat a lot of acorns, they're pooping a lot of calcium out the back end. Gotcha. So you know, if you look at the – and some of these things are just – I'm a simple scientist. I like, you know, I wasn't the smartest rock in the stack, and I like stuff that's really easy to understand. So if you pull up the Boone and Crockett map, just Google Boone and Crockett map, and you look at the distribution or Pope and Young, either one, of trophy distribution, Mm -hmm. and then you go to the U.S. Forest Service and pull up the distribution map of oaks across America, they're opposite. Where there's a lot of oaks, there are very few record book deer. And where there are very few oak trees, which probably means there's agriculture, there's a whole bunch of record book deer. Gotcha. There, there is nowhere, and I mean nowhere, where there's a whole heavy distribution of oak trees and a heavy distribution of record book deer. They are not mutually exclusive, but they certainly exclude each other. They're polar opposites. That's fascinating because I would have thought the opposite, but if the tannic acid's binding to the calcium, it's never getting to the antler. It just can't. Yeah, you know, everybody thinks, boy, those big old timbered areas, the bucks are growing old and getting big. And uh, But think about the big timber belts. Now, where I love acorns, I mean, when, where I love them, you go to, you know, parts of Ohio or Kansas or some of the places I hunt, and it's, you know, whatever, 60, 70, 80% open land, crop land, pasture, whatever, yep. and little blocks of oak trees here and there. When those oaks are raining, it's like a feeder going off. And you know where all the deer in that neighborhood are. I mean, they're going to they're gonna abandon corn and soybeans to go eat acorns. They've been eating acorns since there's been deer. And that cycle is not going to change, literally. Gotcha. So you're out in western Kansas. The, the primary oak tree in Kansas is a bur oak, which is a form of white oak. It doesn't have much tannic acid. And the acorns are huge. They're literally about the size of a golf ball, literally. So, you know, deer don't have to eat a whole lot of those things to get filled up and you're out there on the prairie in Kansas, and there's one giant bur oak that somehow survived a fire and whatever out there. When it's fallen, it is like you fight your buddy for that stand. Deer are coming to that tree. And so, you know, in that situation, I love acorns. They're awesome. It's like finding the old pear tree. One of my favorite early season tactics is, you know, on national forest land or land where it's tough to get a pattern on deer. There's all these old house places, you know, because national forest, we got a member boys wasn't national forest a lot of it wasn't national forest 100 years ago that was private land that that the government some either bought or took through intimate intimate domain or whatever and there was homesteads all over there and those homesteaders they didn't run to kroger and get some groceries they had to provide it so they almost always had some fruit trees in their yard almost always yeah and some of those fruit trees are very hardy especially pear trees some apples but especially pears and they're still they're still making fruit. And you're in the middle of a national forest. There's acorns everywhere, pine trees, whatever it is. And you stumble on a pear tree that's making fruit. You want to do two things. You want to put a stand there, and you want to pick up some of the old pears because those seeds, that tree has survived without any maintenance. No herbicide, no fertilizer. That tree just had the genetic makeup to survive. And you want to you want to plant that tree in your farm. Okay, very good tip. So yeah, that's a great tip. Thinking about the the acorns. All right, so. If you're in the Midwest and you find a, a patch of trees that have acorns on them, this mm-hmm. this bur bur oak tree, bur oak, yeah, yeah. And I mean, how do the deer zone in on it? Is it is it a smell thing or is it a yeah, sound? You know, I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna totally embarrass myself here and tell you one of the ten thousand times my wife has proven me wrong, or where my <laughs> wife is is not a biologist at all. And and I was coming back for some trip where we'd been trapping deer or something. And I'm like, you know, we go to this area 
where corn's illegal, and I don't think anybody's baiting or anything. And we put corn down to, to draw deer in to get them under our rocket net so we can do whatever we're doing to the deer at that project. And within two days, always, the deer find the corn pile. Hmm. I mean, they don't even know what corn looks like, and they find the corn pile. How is that possible? And I'm thinking of some deep, you know, Ph.D., super theory, and my wife said, and just goes, oh, that's so simple. The little fly birds find it, the ones that eat corn, like cardinals or whatever, yep. and they're eating it, and they make a feeding sound, and the deer know when they're making a feeding sound because grain-eating birds, you know, birds have a big beak that can crack grain, are going to eat on the same stuff that deer eat on. Hmm. And the deer hear that, and they just know well, there's something to eat over there. I'm going to go check it out. And i got to tell you, out of 11 years of college, and everything I've did, that's probably the best theory I've ever heard of being accurate of how deer find corn that quickly. Hmm. Interesting. Because, you know, deer have a learning curve for new food. Like, for example, here at my place, Trace and I own this, have bought this land 13 years ago, and there's no soybeans around. There's still hardly any soybeans around. A few of my neighbors are now planting food plots, but there's no commercial beans around for miles, hundreds of miles maybe. I don't know. And and we planted soybeans the first three years, and I don't think a leaf was missing due to deer browse. They would walk right through the soybean field and eat the ragweed where the fertilizer truck hit it. I mean, I mean really? that literally. I mean that literally. If deer have never seen soybeans, they're not going to know their, their food. Right. And just like, you know, years all the time, guys planting turnips, Nebraska's wild, well, planted Nebraska's out there, and doggone deer didn't touch it. I always tell them, good, plant it again next year, because they will. And what I usually do is mix a little something in with the brassicas in areas that haven't seen brassicas before, wheat or something deer know to eat, and just get them nuzzling around in there and just finally want to take a bite. Then it doesn't take long for the rest of them to figure it out. But here at my place, I mean, I swear to you, I could not find a leaf missing. There would be trails through the soybeans. There would not be a leaf missing from them. And you can't hardly grow beans here in Ohio without half of them eaten down by the deer. That's right. Well, same, place, same way at my place now. I mean, you know, they know them now. They love them now. So and that's another great point. Guys always talking about what the deer want to eat during the early season. I tell them it's real easy. What they ate last year. Deer have a very slow learning curve. They don't like surprises. That's why, you know, they don't like to smell the humans or whatever. They don't like surprises. So, you know, if your deer are used to eating wheat or a mixture of wheat and brassicas in September, October, plant it again this year. Just because someone comes out with the latest, greatest food plot, whatever, doesn't mean it's going to work well on your land and the deer aren't used to it. And I'll give you a perfect example that, I, again, I'm guilty of many years ago, many, many years ago, almost 20 years ago. I started a company called Biologic, and then I partnered up with Mossy Oak later on. And and this guy got a hold of me. He says, man, I've got the greatest deer food. We're going out here in West Texas, and deer are coming from miles to eat this stuff. And it grows more than they can eat, and it's inexpensive. And, I mean, it's, you know, it's inexpensive. It's drought-proof. Deer love it. It's everything you want in a food plot plan. I said, really? Oh, man, it's weird thing. So I, I checked it out, and sure enough, I mean, man, it's like caribou migration going this guy's field out in West Texas. And it's six feet tall and growing deer eating it, and it's just growing and eating and growing. And it's inexpensive. It was called brown midrib it's a special type of sorghum that's actually the stalk is palatable not just a seed head and i'm thinking i mean i just tell you i'm greedy thinking i am going to make a million off this i mean man it's everything you want in the food pot blend it's drought resistant deer love it they can't eat it fast enough so we buy a bunch of it stick it in a bag and i gotta tell you I'm not sure a deer ate that anywhere east of Mississippi River, anywhere, <laughs> period. <laughs> so I had to, you know, I had to take my greedy hat off with my scientific hat on, and it was really easy once I started thinking was, in West Texas, especially that summer, it was really dry out there. There's just not a lot to eat. I think if you had a green pickup, deer would have ran out there and started licking on it. Right. <laughs> and, and so deer are selective feeders. And they're going to eat the best food in their neighborhood and pretty much ignore the rest. And that was by far the best food in that neighborhood. You buy it over east where there's, you know, natural blackberry or persimmons or ragweed or whatever. It was so far down the totem pole, deer didn't touch it. And it was a tough lesson for me to learn, but I never forgot that lesson. That's so a early, good one. Er, yeah, early season's about food okay. and, a, and a changing pattern. And, and I like to plant my food plots because... If you're in an area where the acorns aren't falling or if you're in an ag area, you know, those agricultural soybeans, I bet where you guys are, they're starting to get pretty rank, pretty pretty mature. The palatability is decreasing. And if you've got something young coming up three to six inches tall that's nice and tender and lush, deer are going to switch over to that pretty quickly. So 
A tremendous technique for early season is what we call hidey ho or small food plots back in the timber, back somewhere where they don't really associate with danger. And I mean, these things can be pretty small, you know, like living room size or whatever. You just want enough food. You're not feeding a deer herd with the hidey ho food plot. You just want enough food to attract them. And, and I often find like an old pond just went dry or where a big tree's been struck by lightning, somewhere where there's enough sunshine reaching the forest floor for crops to grow. And I usually do them with hand tools. You know, I take my backpack blower or my hand rake or whatever and rake the duff out of the way. If there's just a few saplings in there, I just plant around them. I mean, there's, you know, again, this isn't a beautiful food plot. This is a killing place. And and oftentimes I'll just take in a bag or two of fertilizer and some seed and, and right before rain, throw it down. It's important to do it right before rain. I'll explain that in a second. Throw it down and go and hang my stand that day. And then I don't go back until it's that time to grow and deer find it because the first day I go there, I go to kill a deer. I don't, I don't go there. I don't go put a trail camera on it. I don't scout it. When I go there, I go to kill a deer. Right. That's what I do. And and since you're doing this by hand tools, you know, you're not disking or anything, you want to do it either during the rain, right before rain, because two factors, you'd be stunned at how much of the seed, rodents, you know, squirrels, mice, whatever, and birds will remove. And then that rain will help the seed get seed to soil contact. You got, you know, a seed laying on top of leaf. It may germinate. It's still going to tap root out, but it's not going to grow because it's not getting that root down the soil. So the rain will help kind of wash the seed around and get it buried in soil a little bit. And, and those little hidey hole food plots early and late season are tremendous. And so most plants, most forage plants, you want to plant about 45 to 60 days before the first frost. So here in southern Missouri, our first frost is about October 10th. You know, a little bit farther north, the frost is a little bit earlier. So that means we want to be planting here, Ryan, about mid-August, further north, about the 1st of August, something like that. Get the plants enough time to grow and get big enough and deer time to figure out, hey, this is a safe food source. And, and so deer, you know, they need food cover water. Yep. And it, and everyone just kind of stops right there. And they're stopping one step short of being a successful hunter. They need food cover water that they don't associate with danger because the number one motivating factor of a deer is fear over the rut or anything else. It's survival. They want to survive. They have fear and want survival. A hidey hole food plot, oftentimes it's a new place for me. I've never hunted it before. There's never been a tree stand here before. Deer don't associate it with danger. I'm going to go in, I'm going to rake it out, I'm going to plant it. I'm not coming back to the wind's right. The plants have had time to grow, and, and I'm going to go in on that day with full intentions of killing a deer off that plot that day. Gotcha. So you're you're kind of uh, conditioning them. That's a great word, yeah. Conditioning, okay. yeah. You know, we all remember probably from seventh grade science, whatever, Pavlov's dog. Pavlov was old German scientist and I don't know why he did this or had the budget to do it, but he fed dogs meat, probably steak, every afternoon at 3 p.m. And he rang a bell every time he fed him, rang a bell. And then 60 days later, he rang the bell but didn't feed him, and they salivated. And that's where the first study of conditioned or conditioned response came from. Right. And if you think about it, about everything a hunter does is condition deer to avoid them. And, and right. so I want to hunt in a way where I'm not hunting deer that I've conditioned to avoid my area or my stand or whatever. So, you know, you see deer in a city park or used to joggers and people all the time, they hardly get out of the way because they don't have any fear of humans. They don't have any real reason to fear humans. They're conditioned just to consider humans within 20 or 30 yards just a, a neutral, non-threatening behavior. Is just one plot that is a conditioning plot, so to speak, is, is that enough? Or should you have several different spots? Yeah, that's a great point. You know what I like to do is, you know, I can make these plots in about an hour or two hours, depending on how tough it is to hang the stand or whatever. So starting about late July or early August, I'm going to make, probably make a plot every Saturday. And so they're going to be in different stages of growth and tenderness. And I'm going to do that up till it's just too close to frost date or gets too dry or whatever. And that way you've got new stages of growth coming off at, at you know, different areas on the property. Again, these don't have to be large. These are you know, eighth acre or less type deals. They're they're not pretty. They're not going to be in the front cover cover of you know Farmers of America magazine. Right. Th- these are just a food source in the middle of a non food source area that deer do not associate with danger. And what are we looking for for areas where where these things will grow? Does, does it does they have to be in certain uh, plots of of uh, trees? Like certain trees we're looking for, looking like no, oaks you no. Know, it uh, really, really, the key factor is enough sunlight. You need at least 50% sunlight during the day. Okay. You know, plants are photosynthesizing. they got to make energy. 
So again, I like old ponds or where lightning's killed a big tree somewhere in the forest in a secluded area. Maybe it's the back of a CRP field that you just take a weed eater and, you know, cut out a little area and then take a rake and rake that duff away so the seed will make seed to soil contact. So your first criteria is sunlight. Second criteria is you got to be able to get down to the dirt level with a hand tool or whatever to get seed to soil contact. And I'm not worried about the quality of the soil because, uh, you know, I can tote a 50-pound bag of fertilizer and the area is so small that's like super fertilizing it. And I don't really like these where I can get my four-wheel or two or something because I don't want my, you know, selfishly, I don't want my buddy finding it. You know, I want, this is for me to hunt. So, uh, you know, these little hidey hole food plots, I'm telling you, you can carry everything on your back you need to make them and they are a tremendous tool. Hmm. Gotcha. And how much of a bag are you carrying in is it is it just enough to just follow the instructions on your your bag how what your coverage going to be so wheat for example you know if you're broadcasting wheat you're going to plant like a hundred pounds per acre and if you're planting a tenth of an acre you're you're planting 10 pounds okay so usually i got about 10 pounds of some kind of seed less if you're doing a brassica if deer eat brassicas in your area you know guys four pounds of brassica will plant a whole acre so you just need a couple pounds of brassica because these are rough areas, not all the seed is going to germinate. I'm going to plant at a little heavier rate than normal. You know, this isn't a perfectly tilled Iowa cornfield. So I'm going to plant a little heavier than normal. You're going to assume that the deer are going to eat it. So here's a kind of a concept or a rule that maybe some guys miss. You know, everyone has all the bags have a recommended planting rate. And those are basically based on agricultural recommendations, considering that that plant's going to mature like the a normal soybean farmer is going to plant 180, depending on the soil quality, to 220,000 seeds per acre, or roughly, depending on the bean, about 50 pounds per acre or so, okay? Yeah. I tend to plant in my food plots 80 to 100 pounds per acre of soybeans because the portional stems are going to be browsed or bit off and they're so young, they're never going to mature. Hmm. And if I plant a normal rate, then I'm going to have a pretty sparse field come deer season. Right. If I plant an above normal rate, I know that, you know, let's just use a third as a rule of thumb of the plants are going to be damaged by browse pressure. And because I planted heavy, there's still enough stems out there per square foot to fill in the field come hunting season. Gotcha. And, and people say, well, gosh, that's expensive, isn't it? <laughs> and I'm like, you know, $30 extra seed is nothing compared to dozing out three more acres of food plot. Right. And, and the other advantage is, you know, I'm not a great shot. I like the deer pretty close to my stand. So, if I can concentrate the deer in a smaller food plot, that, that's to my advantage as a hunter. Gotcha. That's I love that tip. All right. So what other things should we be addressing other than uh, acorns and food plots for early season tactics? Is there yep. any, anything we should be thinking about? For yeah, like- so deer, you know, as soon as deer shed velvet, they're starting to think about dominance already. I mean, I watched a couple bucks shoving around night before last. They're, they're not fighting. They're just, you know, tinkling and shoving out dominance, but it doesn't matter if you're in first grade or 12th grade. If you hear a fight in the hallway, you're probably going to look. You may not come too close, but you're going to come look. And and so don't be afraid to have a grunt call with you. And, you know, this is a November big ball and grunt, you know, grunt, snort, wheeze, grunt that you're blowing the big bull of the woods horn on. Yeah. But don't be scared to just, you know, you got a deer at 100 yards, it's getting dark, you want to get him in for a better look or a shot toot on that thing just real lightly and i think you're fine and i did the same thing the other night is at this time of year if you use it appropriately use it lightly it's either neutral the deer totally ignore it or they're curious or come check it out now you know deer's 30 yards away don't blow on the thing because you're gonna blow him out of woods okay but he's 100 yards you just and i I, the other night i mean i started super light and, and i just you know every minute or two i'd crank it up just a touch so i could finally get some type of reaction that i knew at least they heard it Okay. And, and they're either going to respond or they're going to be neutral. And each week, literally each week till you know, mid-November or so, you can be a little bit more aggressive. But don't leave those tools at home. Now, I'm not up there in the stand crashing antlers as hard as I can together this time of year. That's not going to work. But and, and, and between rattling or grunt call, 100% of the time, I'd rather have a grunt call. I mean, both both are good tools. But a grunt call is almost always neutral or positive. And again, the, the wrong time to use a grunt call is that deer is 50 yards or Somewhere where he knows a deer is not there, and you blow that grunt call, he's going to pinpoint exactly where you are or blow out the area one or the other. Gotcha. All right. So we can use some sounds in the woods yeah. to our advantage. Yeah. And mock scrapes are awesome this time of year. I'm, you know, I don't know if y'all have seen our videos on mock scrapes. Yep. They don't. They're not. They don't have to be fancy. You don't have to do anything fancy. We we literally, folks. I mean, we take a T post because. <laughs> 
because I'm lazy. We take a T post and drive it where we want the deer to be standing when we're going to shoot. And there may be 20 scrapes around the edge of the food plot, but none of them are, you know, white, right wind direction or by a big enough tree for a stand or, you know, whatever the problem is. So we go out in front of where we want the deer to be to our advantage. We drive a T post and we go cut an oak or hickory sapling that's about the right height. And it's usually an inch, inch and a half too, but the secret is it's going to have, you know, a big horizontal limb to the ground that's about four feet off the ground. And there's, you know, there's no magic 54 inches, 48 inches. Deer don't always, you know, scrape on the same tree. Trees don't all grow the same. Just something within that reach. Four feet, four and a half feet, something like that. Zip tie that tree to the T-post and you'll be stunned at what happens because you put a, a really easy limb for a scrape to right height out in the middle of a field, I just about promise you deer are going to use it. Oh, they want to be out there where they can detect predators all around. They don't want to be on the edge of the bush where the big bag coyote or the booger bear can get them. Gotcha. Okay. And when you say T-post, what is that? Describe that. Uh, just a steel fence post, you know, a, a T-post, yep. any kind of thing you can secure the tree to. Okay. T-posts right. are cheap. You can buy them, you know, at any farm store, and they drive easy in the ground. You can pull them up and use them again the next year. They're just easy. Gotcha. So you're you're basically making your own tree yeah. in a sense. I, I take a forked limb, uh, and there's a reason just so I'm not putting my stinky human hand because I'm usually sweating after I drive the t post and everything. Mm-hmm. I'm going to take a forked limb and cut the forks off and reach up there and break the overhanging limb so it's hanging down. I want it to look like it, another deer's already used it. I'm going to take that forked limb, and I'm going to pile up the dirt right under that right under that overhanging limb because again, it's a visual effect. I mean, you know what? And it's also an olfactory or an odor effect. What else is digging up dirt that time of year in the deer woods? A big three foot circle, not right, much. Right. Right. So fresh dirt is a is a really good deer attractant. And, and some people put you know deer urns or whatever in there. I don't. Uh, I don't use any scent like that at all. I don't want to alert the deer to look at me in a stand. I don't want spill it on me or put it on me. I don't want the deer looking at me in the stand. My whole objective is not to draw attention to me. Uh, I may urinate myself in that scrape. All mammal urine breaks down to ammonia very quickly. You know, you guys, I know I'm 54 years old. I remember, but it used to be privies or outhouses back behind the church I grew up in. There wasn't any running sure. water in the church, and, and it smelled like ammonia. And one of the old ladies out there cleaning, I mean, all mammal urine breaks down to ammonia rapidly. And just think about this, guys. Here's just something to think about, how rapidly urine breaks down. Most of us have probably seen a doe go in front of our stand or something, you know, during November or whatever, and a buck will cut that trail, and here you go one or two steps one way, one or two steps the other way, and almost 100% of the time, he always goes the same way the doe was going, almost 100% of the time. Now, he's not smart enough, we don't believe, or have the, the, the ability to look at tracks and tell the direction. Literally, the scent is so volatile that within a few yards, he can tell what's older and what's younger, and that's how he knows which direction to go. Right, mm. right, right, right. Good point. So my urine smells like me for five minutes or whatever, and then it starts breaking down and it smells like mammal urine. And in a day or two, it's really broken down. So if I put anything in that mock scrape, it's it's... Grant. Hmm. Grant Buck. <laughs> so they won't, they don't care because it's just breaking oh, down into know, chemical I, parts. I, I have urinated. I'm a kidney. I, I, I'll share with y'all. I'm a kidney transplant patient. Okay. And, and I've been blessed with great health. I've had a transplant 23 years, but I, I, transplant patients should not hold their urine. There's some, you know, some reasons you don't want to get a bladder infection or whatever. So out of my tree stand all across America, I PT. <laughs> I have never, never, never felt that deter a deer from coming in. Interesting. But I've had a bunch of bucks come smell where I TT'd 30 minutes earlier. Okay. No kidding. I would have not imagined that. That's fascinating. You know, I I have all my little oddities and quirks too, but one of them is not carrying a pee bottle through the woods. I pity the poor boys that are still carrying a pee bottle through the woods. (laughs) Yeah, because all these years you hear about the guys that carry it around and – because they don't want the deer to smell them, but in, yeah. in fact, it's I the mean, opposite. Yeah, I mean, your breath is doing, I promise you, your breath is doing way more damage than that. Mm. Okay. Good. So how do you combat the breath now that we're on the topic of breath? What do you do? Yeah, I don't know. I, I use, uh, there's a, a, candidly, I use dead downwind. They are based on enzymes versus bacteria. It's just a little science here. Yep. Uh Back, about 80% of the bacteria on your body is needed to keep you alive. If you killed 100% of the bacteria, 
bacteria on your body, you would die. Literally, you would die. Okay. Most of the bacteria in the world is beneficial. We hear bacteria, and I think we all think of a negative. I mean, I do. You know, I think of strep or, you know, some kind of bad bacteria. Right. But most bacteria in the world, I mean, helps us grow crops or, you know, there's all kind of, of symbiotic or beneficial relationships with bacteria. About 20% of bacteria in the world is considered bad for plants or humans or whatever. So anything that says kills 100% of bacteria, I'm not putting on my body, that's for sure. Right. Enzymes are really cool things. You know, they use enzymes to take the odor out of septic treatment plants in every major metropolitan area across America hmm. because it can it can reduce they can create enzymes to attack or break down, break apart so they're ineffective, very specific molecules. And that's the advantage of using enzymes for sin control. And, and it's not 100% perfect by any stretch, but they can literally make these enzymes for very specific molecules. So humans have two types of sweat. One's just perspiration. And I don't know, you know, maybe you have that. I have the second type, which is that kind of oily sweat. You know, if you're jogging real hard, you get that oily sweat on you. Yeah. That's the stuff that really smells. And and so they can create enzymes to break those apart. They're not they're not doing away with them. They just break them apart so they're not making any odor. Mm. Okay. So I use that for my breath. And another thing some people do, and I don't know, I think there's some science behind it. I've studied it, and I'm kind of on the fence about it. But, I, again, I think it's probably neutral. Is a lot of people suck on apple bits because of the chlorophyll in the apples. Hmm. And chlorophyll is a natural deodorizer. Right. So so a lot of people just, you know, have de- dehydrated because the, the, the dehydration process obviously isn't breaking down the chlorophyll. People take dehydrated apple slices out in the woods and, you know, suck on them all day long. Uh, I, I'm not a huge fan of that because... Apples are a lot of fiber, and that particular reaction of having a lot of fiber in your system is an odor that deer probably don't like too well. So, right. You know, I don't want. I don't know if I if I'm on an all day hunt. The last thing I want to do is start about eight a.m. eating apple bits because by <laughs> noon I'm out of my tree. Good point. All right, so we've covered acorns, we've covered food plots, we've covered uh, mock scrapes, we've covered your breath, we've covered yeah. Um, you know, kind of where to put these things, I think, is an important thing. So yeah. this time of year, you know, deer at my place and most throughout most of the Midwest, they've already shed their summer coat, that that short reddish hair. Yep. You know, deer don't have sweat glands. So they in the summer, they have short red hair, so heat can leave their body very rapidly. The red reflects the sun, and, uh, and, and the short hair just doesn't hold heat. And they're already growing that, that longer, darker hair. They're putting their winter coat on. Deer moat twice a year. They put a summer coat on and put a winter coat on. Hmm. And they literally shed the rest of that hair. And so they got that dark coat on now. And, and, you know, it's still, you know, where you are, you know, 80 degrees, maybe more, maybe less. And they're storing fat. So it's hot, you know. It's like you having to go to work with your overalls on in September. No one does that. Right. So typically bucks, especially a larger, the larger the body of the animal, the tougher it is to get rid of body heat. So if I'm hunting a mature buck right now, this time of year, I'm hunting very close to a bedding area. And these bucks we saw the other night were 100 yards off a of bedding area, a known thicket, um, because they're just not going to get out of that bed very long before dark to go eat. So okay. you don't want to be in the bedding area because you're, you're, you're going to blow them out. You want to find an area where food and cover are very close together in the thermals and wind and whatever it is allows you to approach that area without alerting the deer. Gotcha. Okay. So close. You know, this isn't the old December stand where they're bedded on a south slope trying to stay warm and they're walking two miles to Joe's cornfield that he didn't get harvested because it rained or whatever. They're not doing that this time of year. They're they're moving very short distances. They're uncomfortable. Gotcha. All right. So they're they're hot. They're sweaty. Not that they're really sweaty, but that's the equivalent yeah. to what we would feel. Yeah. And, and, and so also, so that makes it very tough to hunt mornings this time of year because deer are, are feeding and bedding so close together. And in the morning, because you know, pre-daylight, they're probably already on their feet. And so it's very tough to go in in a morning hunt. It takes a really good setup to be able to get in there without alerting deer before you get to your stand this time of year. Hmm. I rarely hunt mornings uh, in September or early October unless... There's a very strong weather front coming in. I mean, that barometer is either really high or really low, and I think deer are going to be really active. Gotcha. Uh, That's a good one. So th- th- this time of year, mornings could be very difficult unless you know the exact situation. Yeah, you need to know what's going on, and somehow you can get in between the two, bedding and cover, without alerting the deer. You've got a, a good backdoor plan, you know, maybe down a creek or, you know, just there's some landform that allows you to get in there. Gotcha. Man, that's good. All right. Anything else that you can think of? 
you know, I want to throw out one last thing is, uh, you know, everyone's scouting this time of year and they say, I, my buddies just say, man, I just found a whole bunch of sign. I, you know, I'm on, a, I'm on top of a bunch of sign. I'm going to get one. I'll say, you know, I don't know about that. Cause just think about this. Where do deer spend most of their time? Where are they going to leave most of the sign where they're most comfortable? Where are they going to spend the most hours? So you find right. a whole bunch of sign. It's probably a feeding area or bedding area. And you really can't hunt either. They're going to feed probably right at dark or after dark right now. And of course, you can't get in the bed near it without alerting them. Uh, so I'm rarely hunting the most sign I find. And that just boggles some hunter's mind. I'm hunting in between two places of the most sign I find. Because if it's the most sign I found, that's where deer are really comfortable. And there's some reason they're comfortable. It means they feel very safe there. And the wind's swirling or they're there after dark or whatever it is. And I probably can't be there at the same time they're there. So the most sign is rarely the best stand location. Hmm. Hmm. That makes a lot of sense, though. It does. Um, I never thought of it like that. But, yeah, it's – so ideally, you want to try to find two spots where there's a lot of sign and then hunt. Yeah, figure out how they're traveling in between there. You know, why are the okay. deer there and, and how are they traveling in between those areas? And then if you really get technical, I mean, if you you know, you're really like – got your razor game on if you know i like these guys always say boy i want to hunt right where the wind's on my nose man it's perfect and if and you can get away with that if you're hunting immature deer or whatever but if you're sure enough trying to you know kill an old wise deer because deer certainly learn um if it's a hundred percent in your favor that means it's a hundred percent against a buck a mature deer and they're probably not going to be there you got to kind of push the edge and, and and you know my ideal wind is like a 45 degree angle i'm just on the edge of getting busted and that deer is just on the edge of feeling safe because if it's totally in my favor that mature buck's not going to feel safe there he's going to be on the edge he's going to be nervous Ooh, interesting so the best stands that that i have the most success out of are those stands where man i'm just right on the edge of being busted you're like man don't don't switch wind don't swirl wind because that's the area where the bucks are probably going to be the most comfortable. I'm talking about during daylight hours. Right, right. Absolutely. Okay. Let's get in a little real quick, Grant, about uh, the water source. You know, we we hear a lot of things, these warmer temperatures, early season, water sources. What what? Give us your breakdown on what would the deer are doing as far as, uh, you know, to hydrate yourself. Yeah. Deer are probably going to water this time of year because the plants, you know, early spring plants are about 70% water, depending on the species of plant. So they're getting most of the water they need just through consuming, you know, young forage. This time of year, that's not true. <clears throat> and if I'm in West Texas or somewhere where standing water is, is just really rare, I'm hunting, you know, 100 yards from the water. I rarely hunt right over water. If I'm going to hunt 100 yards from the water or something like that. Here in the Ozarks where there's creeks and ponds everywhere, in most places where there's creeks and ponds everywhere, boy, it's doggone tough to figure out which source of water they're going to. <clears throat> and another thing is, deer like typically like smaller sources of water. I mean, they're going to go drink out of some little mud hole before they go drink out of a you know a 500 acre lake because a big lake means it's tough for them to avoid predation. Little mud hole doesn't have any noise. The water's not so big; it's causing some funky thermals that rearrange the scent pattern there, and they can they can guard themselves against predation even while drinking. Because remember, the number one motivation for a deer, especially a mature deer, survival. So you've set, let's say you own, you know, seven tree stands, and you set four of them over water sources. You say, man, I got this bad boy limited out. There's four ponds, and I got all of them covered. Whichever way the wind drive for is what I'm hunting. And the day before you go hunting, it comes a thunderstorm, and every cow track and mud puddle fills up with water, and there's not a deer going to a pond anywhere on the property. So I'm not a huge water fan for whitetails. I mean, if you're in the high Rocky Mountains and you're chasing elk, man, water can be critical or you're in West Texas or somewhere really droughty, or it's a drought where you live. You know, boy, you're in an area and the drought just really has dried up most of the ponds. There's no rain in the forecast. Water can be awesome. On the average area from, you know, I'm going to say from mid-Kansas Eastern, it's tough to pattern deer on water. Gotcha. Okay. So, Grant, one other question before we let you go, on, and I appreciate you hanging in there with us and really just filling us full of great information. If like if you're hunting, go back to the deer. They're hot this time of year because it's still hot out, and they don't like to move when they're hot. Sure. Um, are there particular areas of bedding area, or are there bedding areas that you could zone in on, or is it more that you want to zone in on the food areas and the bedding areas will be nearby? 
Is it, which one do you go for? Yeah, that's a great question. So let's think about that just a second. Most of us, I'm going to bet most, myself included, most people listening are going to the same bedroom unless you're traveling for work or whatever almost every night. And you control the conditions by, you know, a thermostat or, or more covers or, you know, whatever it is. Deer don't do that. So deer don't have necessarily a bedding area. They have different bedding areas for different conditions. So this time of year it's warm. They're typically going to bed, if unless you're in flatland, on a north slope where it's cooler. And they're going to bed under some type of shade or cover because the thermals are going to draft cool air in that shade. It's just a sim- simply a comfort zone. And if we were making a living out there on land, we'd be doing the same thing. This time of year we'd be on the shady side of slope. Late winter, we'd be over there on the south side slope trying to get the sun's energy. Okay. So think about bedding areas being where the deer can be safe, A, and most comfortable, B, for those conditions that day. We adjust our conditions, again, through thermostat or what we wear or whatever. Deer have to go where the conditions are most favorable for them. Yep. Okay. And- so north slopes. Heavy timber, uh, they're not, you know, I love, I talk a lot about native grass as bedding cover, Mm -hmm. but that's not a summer bedding cover because you think about it, there's no wind blowing there. It's, if you lay down in a native grass field, it's four or five feet tall. It's stifling hot. There's no breeze blowing, but the sun is shining through the grass down on you. Right. Deer are not bedded in native grass, at least in daytime this time of year. They may go up there at nighttime, but not at daytime. They're going to be under a canopy. On a north slope. What about uh, swampy areas where there's water? Yeah, that kind yeah of where there's evaporate, evaporative cooling going on. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. Any, anywhere where the conditions are favorable for them. Okay. All right. And that's going to change as we progress through the daily. season. Yeah. It can change daily. You right. know, so cold to, to me or deer is 10 or 20 percent cooler than normal for that day. Cold isn't a degree mark on the thermometer. Right. It's not like deer think 30 degrees is cold. You know, if it's supposed to be 70 today, and it's 50, I'm, you can bet I'm going to be hunting, and the deer are going to act a little differently. Just like, you know, guys, the first 60-degree day in the spring, we'll go, man, this is warm, this is great. Yeah. But if it's 60 degrees in July, we're going, ooh, this is a cold day. <laughs> Good point. So they, <laughs> and, and deer are the same way because, they're you know, they got body fat on or different colored hair or whatever it is. Their bodies are made for the average conditions on that day. And if the average conditions are warmer when it's warm outside, they're probably going to be less active during daylight hours. Mm-hmm. And if it's cooler... We're going to be more active. And the opposite is true in the late winter. So, you know, man, it's it's supposed to be, you know, let's say 30 and it's zero. That can shut some deer down for a day or two. But then it warms up to 40. It's 10 degrees warmer than normal. 10 degrees warmer than normal in the rut can be horrible. You know, it's supposed to be 50 and it's 75. That's yep. horrible. 10 degrees warmer than normal in January. I'm going to be out there hunting a season on me and a deer going, whoo, I'm not burning near as many calories today getting food as I did on normal day. I'm going to be on my feet today. Gotcha. All right. So they, they, they will react to the contrasting temperature swings. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, you know, people ask me all the time, how do I predict when to take my vacation? When should I schedule my vacation? Man, if I could solve that question, I wouldn't have to work anymore. And I, 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 for example, I just returned from an elk hunt out in Colorado. Yep. It was 90 degrees most days I was there. 90. It was great hiking weather, but it was horrible elk hunting weather. Right, right. I basically went on some really long hikes with my bow over my shoulder. I mean, I'm there. I'm going to hunt, but the elk weren't doing much where I was. Gotcha. And right. the week before, one of my buddies were tagging elk like crazy. Uh, you know, when it's that hot and, and deer have to regulate their temperature through the behavior and where they bed and whatnot, they just were not moving during the daylight, even when it's a rut for elk. Hmm. So it sounds like we need to pay a little bit more attention to temperature as well. Temperature is a big factor. I mean, I'll take temperature over moon phase seven days out a week. Gotcha. Yeah. Temperature is yeah. a huge factor. Barometer is a factor because barometer is just a, a pretty accurate predictor of weather fronts coming or going. Yeah. Excellent. Wow. We've just covered a lot of stuff. Uh, Dr. Woods, I can't thank you enough for, for spending almost an hour with us. I, th- I think we've... My brain's kind of full right now. <laughs> Dustin, I don't know how you feel. Oh, man, just, just soaking it all in. You know, Dr. Grant Woods is uh, somebody that's uh, full of information, and, and boy, you don't have to talk much to, to get him to spill it and share it, and we appreciate that very much. Yeah, we could talk all night and just listen to Well, we could listen to you for weeks, uh, actually. Um, but I think we nailed the, the you know early season tactics, and – Thanks for sharing all your insights about what you what you've learned over the years. Hey, thanks for the opportunity, and I, I just really wish everyone has a great and safe fall out there. Uh, last thing I'd like to say is, guys, you know, the, our biggest responsibility or our biggest trophy 
is coming home safely. So where those safety harnesses, you know, have gun safety, that's just overlooked and such an important part of having an enjoyable hunt. That Absolutely. is so true. Excellent. Hey, Grant, real quick, uh, where, where can uh, listeners find you? Uh, what, you know, not off yeah. the air. Hey, just go to growing deer, uh, dot TV or growing deer dot com. Either one. We put a, a, we make a weekly video. It's not necessarily honey. It's just about what deer are doing or, what we're learning that week. So just growingdeer.com will get you there. And um, every week we put up a new video. We just celebrated our 300th anniversary, 300 weeks of never having a repeat show. Wow. That's awesome. That's or some content right the there. Other. I haven't figured that out yet. That's yeah, fantastic. It's, a, it's, it's, it's got, you got to be crazy to commit to that kind of stuff. But yeah. That's awesome. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on the, the Big Buck podcast. And you know, I'm, I tune into your television show a lot and uh, i've learned a lot from that and from just talking to you so I, no. I i really can't thank you enough it's quite an honor oh no you guys are great hosts and i appreciate the opportunities best of luck in the whitetail woods great right. hey you guys too have a safe fall and again i really appreciate the opportunity all right we'll be in touch thank you very much take care guys take care i love it when we have doctors on the show because my brain is fried by the time we're done well, not only that jay you can relate with, with your science degree you can relate to everything that they talk about when they get into a little bit of science very much so very much you know, so. And, and i've been kind of laying back and taking all this information in because you know it's it's an opportunity not just to to learn but to actually listen and, and take all this information in that dr grant woods passed along you know it yeah. It, it fulfills your mind and refreshes your system to kick off a, a great whitetail season. Yeah, he's so good at what he does, and he takes it so uh, seriously and professionally. But it, the great part is that he shares it back with everybody else. So, you know, he's not just holding it to himself. He's actually relaying on the information, which helps everybody, which is just, you know, that's He's a great person. Yeah, and you, you, you're going to walk away with it from the show and, and learn something that you, you didn't know, and I, I guarantee it. Right. That's, that's the great thing about Dr. Grant Woods. You know, he, he's born well in the past along and educate uh, other hunters. Right, and I learned a lot on the first show we had him on uh, two years ago on, on episode number 19. Uh, so it's o- almost 100 episodes ago, uh, but I learned as much today as I did then, and – I, th- I don't think we've even touched the surface of what he knows. Oh, absolutely not. But, yeah, thank you, Dr. Grant Woods, for, for joining us for a little while there and, and, and spreading the word about uh, your information and, and technology and, and factual information that you've studied yes. all these years with the Whitetail. Absolutely. And i got to tell you, I am going to pee on my deer scrapes from now on. I think I'm just going to pee out of the tree stand from now on and heck with it. Forget the bottle. That's right. Leaving it home. It's a bottle when you got Dr. Grant Woods telling you that. Telling you to pee on your, your mock your scrape. Stand. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, come on. Does it get any better than that, Jay? We've got permission from the doctor. <laughs> we have the doctor's permission slip. Yeah, I think that uh, I'm going to start bottling my own pee and dumping it out versus buying yeah. stuff that's out there. Yep. Awesome. Just awesome. Thank you, Dr. Grant Woods. So, Dusty, do we have a Chubby Tines tip of the week this week? Yeah, we do. Pee out of your tree stand. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Period. Done. All that, that's right. it, man. Uh, you know, I'm sticking with Doctor what Dr. Grant Woods tells us. Pee out of your tree stand. Love it. Absolutely. All right. Well, that being said, Dusty, where can we find you when you're not peeing out of your tree stand and not <laughs> here on the mic? Coming. I knew it was coming. <laughs> you can uh, shoot, shoot me an email, Dusty at BigBuckRegistry.com. You can also look me up on Facebook, Facebook.com forward slash Chubby Gobbler, Facebook.com forward slash Chubby Tines Outdoors. If you want to hit me up on Instagram, at Chasing Antler. Jay, where can the people reach out to you when you're not thinking about me peeing out my tree stand? <laughs> well, that's uh, that's an interesting <laughs> visual. Um, you can find me. Uh, best place to reach me is Jay at BigBuckRegistry.com. Uh, shoot me an email there. You can always find our entire Facebook contingent at Facebook.com forward slash BigBuckRegistry. If you just shot a fantastic deer and you would like to get some recognition for it, it's, it's not a contest and you're not going to win anything, but it's all about pride and, and just being happy with the, with your success and showing it off to other hunters who will appreciate it as well. Go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck. All the instructions are right there. We'll get it posted up on Facebook for you. Uh, other than that, if you're listening to this show on an Apple device, please, please, please subscribe to this show. 
And uh, if you love the show enough, leave us a review by doing a search for Big Buck Registry and typing in a five-star review if you like the show. If you have a few extra bucks and you'd like to donate to help our cause to pay the bills around here, it's bigbuckregistry.com forward slash donate. And if you would like to use our app to listen to the show, bigbuckregistry.com forward slash app. Or if you're on an Android device, bigbuckregistry.com forward slash G app. I think that's about it, brother. That's a whole lot of big buck. You know, and thanks again to Dr. Grant Woods for filling our minds full of information that we can very well easily take our hunt to the next level with. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Well, I'm Jay Scott. And I'm Dusty Phillips. This is the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. See you next week. Can't wait. Can't wait.